when we look at the Bible, the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the inherent word of God. If you understand also that the Bible is the number one selling book of all the religions in the world, the Bible is the number one selling book. And it's a privilege to be a part of this feat, to have a book that is number one selling. And I want you to understand when you think about the Bible, the Bible is our manual, it's our instruction. Folks like to ask that God don't speak to you, but this is one way that God speaks to us through his word. When we think about the Bible, the Bible is divided into two parts. There is the Old Testament and there is the New Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. There is 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. When you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is descriptive. When you look at the New Testament, the New Testament is definitive. The Old Testament is descriptive because it's describing a series of events. If you pay attention to the Old Testament, it's describing a series of events. That's why Ezekiel said it's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. It's like a cycle of events that's happening in the Old Testament. Israel failed God. They fell into captive to the enemy. God raised up a deliverer to bring them out. And the cycle continued. That's why Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun. Because everything that's happened in the Old Testament, you could have identified with it. It keeps going on and on. But when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament is definitive. It's defining words rather. Because men will say the Bible contradicts itself, but that's not the truth. The Bible don't contradict itself. Men's interpretation of the Bible contradict the Bible. Because when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament says, for example, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. World in that context here is referring to mankind. But when we go to the letter or the epistle of John, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For he that loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. World in this context here is referring to a world system. If you don't understand it, if you don't interpret it properly, you might think it's contradicting itself. For example, in the Gospels, Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Power in this context is referring to exousia. It's referring to authority that you exercise. And when you look in the book of Acts, he said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Power in this context is dunamis. It's dynamite power, explosive power, miraculous power. Bless the name of the Lord. So the Old Testament is descriptive and the New Testament is definitive. So when we look at the New Testament, we're going to look at the four Gospels that bear a record of Jesus' ministry. We're going to look at the four Gospels and we're going to start with the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is he, the author is a tax collector. And the author now is writing to a Jewish audience uh, to convince them that Jesus is the king of the Jews, the promised Messiah in the Old Testament. It's interesting that some of the hardest people to convince is religious people. This is what the author was trying to do. He was trying to convince them that, listen, Jesus is the king of the Jews. It went so far that when they crucify him and they wrote on his plate the subscription to put on his cross, Pilate wrote the king of the Jews. And one of the Pharisees said, don't put the king of the Jews. Put, he said, he is the king of the Jews. But Pilate said, what is written is written. The king of the Jews. But I want you to understand, Jesus is not only the king of the Jews. He is a seven-way king according to S.M. Lockridge. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of the heavens. He's the king of glory. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of kings. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. Uh, could I have a bit of more volume, please, if you don't mind? Excuse me. Could I have a bit of more volume? Thank you. And I begin to shout, you can lower it down. Bless the name of the Lord. So the gospel of, thank you, the gospel of Matthew, then we're going to come to the gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark presents Jesus to us as the Son of God. Because when we look at the Gospel of Mark, what the, what the author does, he presents Jesus' works, 
more than his words. The author presents Jesus' miracles more than his messages. In other words, the, gospel, in other words the, the author wants us to know Jesus didn't only talk the talk, he walked the walk. He didn't only talk about miracles, he demonstrated miracles. Jesus didn't only talk about healing, he healed folks. I want you to understand if Jesus say he's going to deliver you, bless the name of the Lord, that means he's going to deliver you. If Jesus say he's going to bless you, that means he's going to bless you. If Jesus say he's going to bring you out, that means he's going to bring you out. Because he's not only lip service. He's not just going to say something and don't mean it. He keeps his promise. So the author presents him as the son of God as he begins to operate in such power on earth. And he was the son of God because even the demons cry out, leave us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, thou son of the most high God? So in the gospel of Matthew, he is the king of the Jews. And in the gospel of Mark, he is the son of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. You guys stay with me. We're going somewhere. In the Gospel of Luke now, the author presents him as the Son of Man. And he wants us to understand that Jesus could identify with what you are going through. He is the Son of Man. He understands uh, the problem that man faces. He understands the problems that man is dealing with. In other words, he is the suffering servant. He could exp he have experienced all that you have been through. So when you're crying in the night all by yourself, you could talk to Jesus because he understands. When you're dealing with a heartbreak, you could talk to Jesus because he understands. When you're dealing, glory be to God, with being treated unfairly, you could talk to Jesus because he understands. When you're dealing with betrayal, you could talk to Jesus because he understands. When you're dealing, glory be to God, with folks that don't like you, you could talk to Jesus because he understands. The author presents him as the son of man. The author in the book of Luke, he traced Jesus' genealogy straight to Adam. So that any historian or biological, anyone that's exploring can realize, listen, Jesus exists in history. In fact, he's the greatest figure that ever lived. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. In the gospel of John, the gospel, hallelujah, the author goes deeper. And scholars will say he opened in a great orchestra of symphony. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So much grace that we don't deserve it. Sometimes we walk in the house of God and we feel like we deserve certain things. Sometimes we act and we fold our arms and we feel like we deserve certain things. You don't deserve God's grace because grace is the unmerited favor. We like to talk about what we deserve. Let's talk about what we don't deserve. We don't deserve God's grace, but yet he still gave it to us. And full of truth because he is God. So in chapter 1 in the book of John, the author presents Jesus as the word of God. You have to understand now that God has always been speaking to man by his word. When we look at the Old Testament, we see the law and the prophets. The, the law represents God's word in written form. And the prophets represents God's word in spoken form. But now Jesus represents God's word in personal form. Bless the name of the Lord. Because you have to understand the law and the prophets could not have free you. The law was a schoolmaster to Christ, and the prophets foretold his coming. That's why you have to understand the only one that could free you is Jesus. Keeping the law can free you. Even receiving a prophecy can free you, but Jesus could free you. That's why the scripture says that the servant abided not in the house forever. Moses was a servant and Elijah was a servant. But Jesus is the son of the living God. And the scriptures say who the son set free is free indeed. In chapter 1, he is the word of God. In chapter 2, he is the son of man according to the gospel of John. And in chapter 2, the thing about what I love about Jesus, he went to a wedding. Jesus wasn't so sophisticated that he couldn't socialize with people. You can't be so heavenly minded that you got no earthly goods. It's not how hard you shout in the spirit. It's how straight you could walk when your foot touched the ground. Some folks like to act like they're so holy and they're holier than thou. But Jesus was able to socialize with people in a wedding. 
I'm telling you, Jesus was able to socialize. And you know how a wedding does be. You know the kind of behavior in a wedding. You know this kind of song that's been played in a wedding. But yet Jesus would sit among folks. And not only that, he worked his first miracle in a wedding. Because he's representing now, wedding now represents marriage. It goes back to the Old Testament from the beginning of Adam and Eve. It's God ordained. Marriage is God ordained by God. And let me just clear it up for a confused world. Marriage is still between one man and one woman. Bless the name of the Lord. So he worked, he, worked, um, he worked miracles in a wedding. But yet down in the lower chapter of John 2, he is rebuking folks in the temple. He is around sinners and working miracles. But here when he comes around religious folks, he says, you have taken my father's house to the house of prayer and make it a den of thieves. You see, you got to understand when you replace prayer with money, then you're in trouble. When you replace worship with money, then you're in trouble. The temple was a place where you ought to worship God. The temple was a place where you ought to praise God. The temple is a place where you ought to sacrifice to God. But these religious folks were doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Jesus said, they take my father's house and make it a den of thieves. You see, nothing is wrong with money because mon the scriptures say money answers all things pertaining to this life. But when money becomes your master, then you're in trouble. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. When love of money, hallelujah, controls you, that's, that, that's when it becomes the root of all evil. Because when they tempt Jesus, they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said to them, whose subscription is that on the coin? They said, Caesar. He said, well, okay, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. In other words, if you look at the image on the coin, Everything in Caesar's image is subjected to Caesar. But I want to show you a deeper truth. Everything in God's image is subjected to God. And he wants you to understand even Caesar is in God's image. Bless the name of the Lord. You hear what I said? Caesar is in God's image, but not his likeness. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. In chapter 3, he is the divine teacher. In chapter 3, he's a divine teacher. He met with Nicodemus. Bless the name of the Lord. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus being a master of Israel, a teacher of Israel, and said, Lord, how could one enter his mother's womb another time? He said, you being a master of Israel, a teacher of Israel, and know not these things. He said, that which is born of the flesh is of the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is of the spirit. In other words, a natural birth is a natural birth. And a spiritual birth is a spiritual birth. A natural birth is from beneath. And a spiritual birth is from above. And then he turned and he preached the greatest message to one man. Jesus preached the greatest message to one person. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that who, whosoever qualifies anyone for salvation, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter your creed, it doesn't matter your religion, it doesn't matter your educational status. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But through him, by believing in him, you would have eternal life. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. You guys stay with me, guys. We're going there. We're getting there. In chapter 4, he is the barrier breaker. In chapter 4, he met a woman, hallelujah, at a well. A Samaritan woman. Glory be to God. And according to the, 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 the history and the tradition back then, Jews and Samaritans, like they were arch rivals. They ought not to speak to each other. But I found out why it is the Jews don't like the Samaritan. You see, it goes way back in history. When God was dealing with the children of Israel and bringing them out of Egypt, what happened? Some of the Jewish men went with Gentiles, with Gentile women and they made children. And when they made children, the Samaritan came about. So in other words, technically, there's some kind of relation between the Jews and the Samaritan. It's like in our life today, the Samaritans were half Jews, half Gentiles. But I want you to understand, Jesus bridged that barrier. Jesus broke that barrier. Jesus broke the barrier of culture. 
he break the barrier of gender also. Because back then, a man not supposed to be talking to a woman. In fact, women had to be silent. But Jesus break that barrier. I'm telling you, Jesus will break barrier to get us together in one house to praise and worship the Lord. He said the, 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 the hour is coming and the hour is now. Because there are some barriers that need to be broken. Because God wants his worshippers to worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter your genealogy. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your creed. It doesn't matter your color. For God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. He break that barrier down. Huh? Ah, now we are all one in Christ. Huh? Paul said they are neither Jew nor Gentile, born nor free, rich or poor. We are one in him. Bless the name of the Lord. And we got one blood. That's the blood of Jesus. In chapter 5, he is the great physician. Jesus is a healer. Bless the name of the Lord. He said those at whole don't need a physician. But those that are sick need a physician. The Bible said that there was a man at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years waiting for the angel to trouble a pool. And I'm telling you, waiting for 38 years, that could have been miserable. That could have been uncomfortable. Sometimes you're waiting and you're waiting, you feel like you're helpless. But even though you're helpless, don't be hopeless. I say, even though you're helpless, don't be hopeless. This man was waiting for 38 years. 38 young years, I'm telling you, from one day, folks might encourage him. The second week, folks might encourage him. The third month, the encouragement started to reduce. One year, folks not even telling them words again. It's like, you might as well just live with that 38 years. God not going to move. But when Jesus shows up, hallelujah, I say when Jesus shows up, I don't know how long you have been waiting by a pool, but when Jesus shows up, he is the great physician to heal you. He healed the man. He said, listen, Take up your bed and walk. Hallelujah. First, he asked him a question. Do you want to be made whole? You've been in a situation so long. You're so confused. Here's what they say. I have no man. That's not the question. Sometimes you're dependent on the wrong people to help you. Sometimes you're dependent on man to help you. Fear is the help of man. I will lift up my eyes unto the hill from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. All those that jumped in the pool was healed. But this man was made whole. In other words, he was whole in his body, soul, and spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. In chapter 6, he is the bread of life. He said to the religious folks, he said, listen, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and they are all dead. He said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. You see, bread represents something that will sustain your material need. But Jesus said, listen, don't just work for the things that perish. Don't just go for things to, to, to feed your body. He said, you need the bread of life. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Ah, glory be to God. That's why he said, give us this day our daily bread. He's not just referring to material need, because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You need that spiritual bread on a daily basis. You need that spiritual bread to keep you anchored. You need that spiritual bread to keep your foundation strong. You need that spiritual bread, hallelujah, for you to stand against the storms of life he said i am the bread of life unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you it doesn't matter what bread you have been eating uh, what's the name of the bread up here Warburton. hallelujah uh, what's the name of the bread king's mill those bread can sustain you but the bread of life can sustain you in chapter 7, he said, he's the water of life. He said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You see, the thing about is mankind is thirsty. I say mankind is thirsty. But the problem is, you're using a, you, the wrong thing to quench your thirst. Uh, I want to let you know, glory be to God, social media can't quench your thirst. Uh, money can't quench your thirst. Uh, a fame and fortune can't quench your thirst. Uh, the cigarette can't quench your thirst. Uh, alcohol can't quench your thirst. Uh, your best friend can't quench your thirst. Jesus can quench your thirst. Uh, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I don't know who you believe and who you going to to quench your thirst but come to the fountain of life and drink for the scripture say he that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled 
In chapter 8, he's the defender of the weak. I love Jesus. This is one of my favorite parts when I was reading my word. I love chapter 8. He's a defender of the weak. Jesus will defend you when you're weak. Because folks don't understand sometimes the difference between weak and wicked. Sometimes it could be weak and you need somebody to defend you. You need somebody to defend you when, 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 when folks talking about you. You need somebody to defend you when folks assassinating your character. You need somebody to defend you when folks dragging you down. You need somebody to defend you when folks have nothing good to say about you. He is the defender of the weak. Hallelujah. The thing about it is that these religious folks, they brought unto Jesus a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And when they brought the woman, they said, according to the law of Moses, she ought to be stoned. The thing about it, what I love about Jesus, he always rebuked the religious folks, but the sinners, he dealt with them gentle. Because anytime you come to Jesus proud, he will call you out. But anytime you come humble, he will treat you gentle. Don't you know the script that says you resist the proud, but he give more grace to the humble? I'm telling you, I'm, these kind of things that Jesus said to the religious folks. He said, look, oh hypocrites, generation of vipers who have warned you for the judgment to come. For you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You have shut up the kingdom of God and you yourself can't even enter. He said, look at you. He said, look at you. He said, Jonah, Jonah's generation, repent of the message of Jonah, what he preached. And greater than Jonah is here. He said, the queen of Sheba come all the way to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And the people repented. And greater than Solomon is here. You wouldn't repent. You have made the commandment of God of no effect to your vain tradition. He would always rebuke them. He said, open sepulchre full of dead man bones. Generation of viper. No sign shall be given unto you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Jesus always called them out. When a religious Jesus will call you out but when you're humble he will, he will raise you up. He defended the weak. He said to the woman right on the ground. He without sin cast the first stone. He draw the line. Draw the line with a finger because according to the law it was the finger of God that wrote the first law. And now he's writing with the finger of God. He's rewriting the law. Theologians will say he's rewriting the law. In other words, he's writing and tracing the words because it's the finger of God that wrote the first law. Moses wrote the second law and now he's writing the law on the ground. Ye without sin cast the first stone. None of them could have accused the woman. He said, where is that accuser? Go and sin no more. What he dealt with there, he dealt showed righteous judgment. He showed the woman mercy, but yet it was justice. Go and sin no more. Jesus will defend you, but he's also righteous. He said, go and don't partake in such lifestyle no more. Don't go and do those things anymore. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus. We're going to get into chapter 10. Hallelujah. In chapter 9, he is the light of the world. Hallelujah. He said, men, these are evil. They rather walk in darkness. He said, but once you're following me, glory be to God, you shall never walk in darkness. You see, darkness represents sin. Darkness represents evil. Darkness represents the things of the occult. Darkness represents fear. Darkness represents doubt. He said, I am the light of world. I am the light of the world. Whosoever followeth me shall never walk in darkness. And I want you to understand the, book, the Bible said when the light shines, darkness cannot comprehend. And I come to speak that every darkness that's coming up in your life, whether the darkness of doubt in your mind, whether the darkness of fear in your mind, whether the darkness uh, that's trying to torment you, hallelujah, I come to speak the the light of God on this morning. Just as he spoke in Genesis about the darkness, he said, let there be light. I speak light over you in that dark situation. Cause that darkness to back up. I say light over your situation. I speak light in your marriage. I speak light in your home. I speak light over your children. I speak light over your family. I speak light over your church. Let there be light. And now we come to chapter 10. Now he's our good shepherd. He's a good shepherd now, and this runs parallel to Psalms 23. You see, you got to understand a shepherd. A shepherd is the one that will take care of his sheep. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. You see, the thing about it is, as a sheep, there are carnivorous animals out to get you. There are wolves and lions that are out to get you. It seems like these animals want blood. Yes, they want to eat up your flesh. That's why the psalmist says... 
When my enemies and my foes come to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fall. You see, a good shepherd will protect you from animals. He will protect you from those wolves. He will protect you from those lions. Not only that, as a shepherd and you being a sheep, he said, my sheep know my voice, but a hireling, he will not listen to you. I'm speaking to every sheep on this morning. Why are you listening to the voice of the devil? Why are you listening to the voice of the enemy? Why are you listening to the voice of Nancy? Why are you listening to the voice of those that say that you can't make it? Why are you listening to the voice of those that are trying to pull you down? Why are you listening to the voice of those that say you're not going to be nothing? He said, my sheep knows my voice, but another voice you wouldn't listen to. That means you've got to put a deaf ear to what the devil is saying. Put a deaf ear to what the enemy is saying. Put a deaf ear to every negative thing that's coming your way. Put a deaf ear to it. Don't listen to the negative voices. The devil is a liar. My sheep know my voice. And I know the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is to liberate me. The voice of the Lord is to lift me up. The voice of the Lord is to free me. The voice of the Lord is to bless me. The voice of the Lord is to anoint me. When you think of a sheep now, a sheep now, the shepherd's responsibility was to anoint the head of the sheep. Because there are a lot of flies with the being in the air. And he would anoint the head of the sheep so that the flies wouldn't get into the sheep eye to blur their vision. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I see he would anoint the sheep head so that no fly could get into your eyes to blur your vision. To cause you to see things blurred. To cause you to see things tainted. He would anoint the sheep head. Not only that, the anointing of the oil, the oil that they used in that time, it had a certain aroma. It had a certain scent that it would expose the snakes in the grass. Uh, yes, the, the oil will expose the snakes in the grass. The snakes will smell the anointing. I don't know about you, hallelujah, but I'm anointed with oil, hallelujah. The snakes smell me long time, hallelujah. I say all oh, the snakes in the grass smell me long time because I'm anointed with oil. So when they strike with the venom, when they strike with the poison, hallelujah, because of the anointing, the yoke shall be destroyed. You will anoint the sheep here with oil. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's why David say, Hallelujah. Thou anointest my head with oil. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. And then he goes further down. Hallelujah. He say, I'm the good shepherd. I'm protecting my sheep. But the thief... The thief come to kill, steal, and destroy. And this is where I'm at on this morning. Don't you know that the enemy is not playing with you? Don't you know that the enemy wants to steal your joy? He wants to steal your joy in such a way that they can't even enjoy more the temporary at that time, your present happiness, your present circumstances, you, you don't even want you to enjoy it. He wants you to focus on the future so much that you're not enjoying the present. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. Hallelujah. But Jesus said, I came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. When you think about the enemy, hallelujah, this is not to mess with nobody theology, but let me tell you something. And in no way I'm going to glorify the devil, but you have to understand who you're dealing with. Satan is a mystical monster. Satan is a dragon. Satan is an instigator and a killer. Satan is our adversary. Satan is Beelzebub. Satan is the god of this world. Satan, hallelujah, he seek whom and who seek and whom he may devour. He's a murderer from the beginning. Jesus called him the father of lies. He's treacherous. He's poisonous. He has murderous proclivities. He wants to kill you, destroy you, and take you out. But I got news for you. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Ah, the same extremity that the enemy goes to take you out is the same extremity God is moving in into your life. The same passion that the enemy is coming at you is the same passion that God is moving at you. Jesus is the king of glory. Jesus is the I am that I am. Jesus is the Lord of hosts. Jesus is the ancient of days. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus for this purpose was a son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Every plan of the enemy over your life. Jesus Jesus manifests to destroy it. Sickness, he manifests to destroy it. Bitterness, he manifests to destroy it. Oppression, he manifests to destroy it. Depression, he manifests to destroy it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you must understand who you are. Because having a pity party, folks will rejoice with you in a pity party. But folks will rejoice, hallelujah, when you're praising God. Folks will rejoice when you're down, hallelujah. But folks will rejoice when you're up. 
folks will prefer lift you up when you're dead, but will even lift you up when you're alive. Don't you know that when you're dead, it takes people to lift you up and carry you? Folks will prefer lift you up when you're dead, but when you're alive, they will lift you up. But I want you to understand, hallelujah, the Bible said that they got to put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Wash your face, dress nice, look nice, step out and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Because folks like you to be depressed. Folks like you to be suffering. Folks like when things are going bad. But as soon as God begins to bless you, as soon as God begins to move in your life, they don't like it. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. I speak abundant life over you. I declare live on this morning. I say live on this morning. Live! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know who has been speaking in your head. Who told you you're going to die? Who told you you're going to be cut off? The devil is a liar. I declare life over you on this morning. I declare healing over you on this morning. I declare power over you on this morning. I declare strength over you on this morning. I declare power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Satan wants to steal your joy. He wants you to be miserable. He wants you to always be mourning. But I got news for you. God came that you might have life. And in my closing, I want you to understand. The scripture says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he had founded it upon the seas and he has established it upon the flood. Who shall stand in his holy place? He that had a clean hands and a pure heart who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and from the God of his salvation is this the generation that seek him is this the generation that seek him lift up your heads O ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is the king of glory the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle still strong still mighty still strong Still mighty, still strong, still mighty, still strong, still mighty, still strong, still mighty, still slain giant. Ah, God Almighty, receive life on this morning, receive strength on this morning, receive power on this morning, receive anointing on this morning, receive favor on this morning, receive power. The devil wants us to sit back there and one and, and just take legs. The devil is a liar. We know the God that we serve. I say we know the God that we serve. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Don't you know if God be for us, who could be against us? Call which name could be against us. Call which power could be against us. Call which entity could be against us. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run not into it and they are saved and they that trust in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion which cannot be removed but abided forever. For God had highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. You gotta tell some things to bow on this morning. At the name of Jesus I command you to bow. In the name of Jesus, I command you to bow. In the name of Jesus, I command you to bow. In the name of Jesus. And every tongue must confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus is Lord. When I call on that name, who could stand before me? When I call on that name, demons tremble. When I call on that name, sickness back up. When I call on that name, hallelujah, opposition got to flee. Hallelujah. Some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots. But we will remember the name of the Lord. I declare unto you on this morning, live! Don't just survive. Live! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Enjoy life. Hallelujah. Enjoy life. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Give him praise. Thank him for everything. But don't forget to live. Live in joy. Live in power. Live in abundance. Live in peace. Live with hope. Live with faith. Hallelujah. Most of all, live with power. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word on this morning. We bless your name. We give you praise. We give you honor, Lord. The word said you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And for those who are listening unto me on this morning, you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not a child of God. Jesus came that you might have life. And this life is eternal life. Hallelujah. This life is eternal life. 
But who the Son said free is free indeed. If you're not a child of God, if you're not born again, Jesus came that you might have life. But you must first accept him as your Lord and Savior. So if you're listening to me right now, I want you just to repeat this prayer after me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The scriptures say, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's simple. So I just wanted to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I've heard your word and I realize I'm a sinner. Lost and undone, Lord. But Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to come into my life, Lord. I surrender to you. I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior, Lord. Give me the strength, Lord, and give me the grace to live for you the balance of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you need prayer on this morning, you can come forward. If you need prayer, come forward. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might live and live in abundance. If you need prayer for anything that the enemy is trying to rob you of, he wants to rob you. The devil wants to rob you. And if you pay attention, it's a thief. You wouldn't even know when it creep up on you. There is a difference between a thief and a robber. A robber will break through these doors here and everybody going to know. A thief is going to come at night. The wee hours of the night. It will creep in on you. That's how he wants. He wants to creep in and take your peace. He wants to creep in and take your joy. And he's going to use every little thing that's happening in your life, in your family, in your job, in your school. Every little thing he's going to use to creep in. And when all of a sudden, you have no joy anymore. All of a sudden, you're just bitter. All of a sudden, you don't want to serve the Lord. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, worship us. Could you help me? Hallelujah. We sing there is a healing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You guys stretch your hands. There's a healer. The high. We believe in God for the supernatural. And there's a He. We are trusting and we are believing God for the supernatural. The, the power of God is in Tipton Christian Church. The power of God is in this church. And I you haven't seen anything as yet. Ah, I say you haven't seen anything as yet, but God is, a, is about to do in this place. Hallelujah. The latter will be greater. I say the latter will be greater in this house. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we stand on your word on this morning that you came to give us life and life in abundance. We declare healing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Healing in abundance for her body, Lord, for her soul and her spirit. Be healed by the spirit of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen.